You remember when Jesus predicted to the disciples, I'm going up to Jerusalem and I will be handed over to the authorities and the elders will condemn me and the Gentiles will crucify me. And Peter jumps in and says, I will not let that happen. And Jesus swings on him and says, get behind me, Satan. Satan loves the glory of Jesus minus cross. So what is the spiritual sight of glory that saves? That's the question John Piper answers from John 2, 23 to 25 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on January 11, 2009. Now remember, this is quite unsettling, at least to me, in a book that is designed to awaken faith. Because why would you want to mess it up? You know, why would you want to mix it up and confuse matters? If your goal is to help people believe John and Jesus, why you bring up this issue of there's faith, but it's not really faith? That kind of confuses the matter. And, and it needs to be clarified. The only reason they would do this, the only reason Jesus would talk like this is if, if it weren't a part of his love for us. There is faith that is not saving faith. You don't want to have that. You don't want to go into eternity thinking you're a believer and you're not a believer. This is love here. Verse 23, second half of the verse, John chapter 2. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing Verse 24, instead of being thrilled about that, it says, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew them. And what he knew, he didn't like and would not sit with, walk with. He wouldn't give himself. This faith in verse 23 has got something wrong with it. Something wrong here. And we need to figure this out. Because you don't want to be in the... You don't want verse 23 to be said of you. I saw his signs. I believed in his name. And he walked away from me. (laughs) I thought you wanted me to see your signs, believe in you, and have eternal life. Why are you walking away? That's a very serious question. So, are there any clues in this text as to what's wrong with this faith in verse 23? I see two. One is the word signs. They believed in his name when they saw the signs. That's a pointer. It's not an answer. It's just a pointer toward the answer. And the second one is... Let me stick in a parenthesis here, see if you know this. I'm sure the students know it, but maybe everybody doesn't know it. You know that in in this book, the Bible, the chapter divisions and the verse divisions were added later. We know that. Everybody on the same page there. When John wrote John, he he didn't put in verse numbers and chapter divisions. That was added by editors later just to help us get around in the letter. Just like when you write a letter, you don't put verse divisions in the letter. (laughs) You don't expect anybody someday to be quoting the verses in your letter. Which means when you're reading the Bible, you should ignore them. Don't pay any attention for meaning's sake. It might help you know how much to read today, but as far as meaning goes, forget it. The chapter divisions get in the way more often than they help. That's not an overstatement. Here, it's in the way, big time. So scrap chapter 3 as a division marker, and you might get a second clue as to what's wrong in verse 23. What's wrong is that the people in verse 23, I think, are represented by Nicodemus. 
And Nicodemus appears on the scene immediately to illustrate the problem in verse 23. Okay, so let's, let's read and see if you see that. Starting at verse 25 and then reading into chapter 3, which we will ignore the division of. I'm at the end of verse 25. Jesus himself knew what was in man. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs. That's the same word as back in verse 23. That you do unless God is with him. Now. That's pretty impressive faith. He's saying, you're from God. God is with you. He is enabling you to do wonderful works called signs. I believe that. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, you need to be born again. This faith is not what I'm after. You think I'm from God, you think God is with me, you think I do signs, you're right, and that's not faith. It's a kind of faith. Muslims believe in Jesus like that today. Jews believe in Jesus like that today, at least pious Orthodox ones. He's a prophet. He's um, from God. He's a miracle worker. God is with him. Muslims believe that, Jews believe that, lots of secular people believe that. And Jesus says to all those people, you need to be born again because you can't even see the kingdom of God until you're born again. Well, what would born again do for you? What's wrong with the faith? That's the question. So that's the first clue. Nicodemus comes on the scene as a person who has a lot of beliefs about Jesus, but Jesus says he needs to be born again, and so his belief isn't what's necessary. What else is wrong? Well, take that word signs in verse 23. Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Is that a problem? Well, Nicodemus saw the signs, and he's blown away by how amazing they are, and he, his faith rises to the level of, you're from God, and God is with you, and you're a faithful teacher in Israel, and, and his faith is rising. But what, what's wrong with sign-driven faith? Jesus warned against this. Sign-based faith is so precarious. It's precarious because of what's under it, and it's precarious because of where it's going. Let me illustrate. Go with me to chapter 7. I want to show you something. And the light it sheds back on chapter 2, verse 23, is very bright. Chapter 7, verses 3 through 5 is talking about his brothers, Jesus' physical brothers. Let's see what it says. So his brothers said to him, this is verse 3, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't make sense. (laughs) Not at first. What? Let's try that again. If you do these things, go on up. Now, you, you are a miracle worker. We've seen them. We've seen Capernaum. We've seen Cana. We've seen water go to wine. Come on. Brother, go up to Jerusalem and do these things so that everybody can see you and stop hiding yourself in the backwater of Nazareth and Capernaum and Cana and Galilee. Get up and do the big stuff. 
because they didn't believe on him. What? If, if they don't believe on him, what are they saying? This is really perplexing. And if you get it, you'll understand 2.23, 24, and 25. Because this, this unbelief in 7.5 is the same as the belief in 2.23. It's sign-driven, sign-seeking, sign-mongering faith. They believed. They believed their brother was a great teacher sent from God who could work miracles and ought to be swept up into a great movement of acclaim and praise and kingship. And they're the brothers and they're going to be swept with him. Hmm. Hmm. And Jesus looks at that. John looks at that and says, that's not faith. Why? What's the root problem here? Now, there is a verse, I think, that nails the root problem. Just nails it. And it's chapter 5, verse 44. So you can go there with me if you want to see the nail driven through this issue. This one, this one stabbed me because I'm a, I'm a vain person. I'm a lover of the glory of men. I like people to say nice things about my sermons. I like compliments. I like to be paid attention to. I like to be liked. And I am born with that idolatry. So what, what's that got to do with faith? Verse 44 of chapter 5. It's a rhetorical question. You know how rhetorical questions work. The answer is so obvious you don't need to give it. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? What's the answer to that question? You can't. Let's make a statement out of it. You can't believe in me while you're seeking glory from one another and not seeking the glory that comes from God. Why not? Because faith consists in breaking that idolatry. Breaking the back of the praise of the love of man. When Jesus calls a person, he says, if anyone would follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and die with me. You don't glut your addiction to self-exaltation when you follow Jesus. That's what his brothers were doing. Come on, come on, Jesus. Go up there and get a name for yourself. Go up there and be the miracle worker that you are and we'll be riding into Jerusalem on the wake of your fame. And Jesus looks at him and says, that's not faith. You remember when Jesus predicted to the disciples, I'm going up to Jerusalem and I will be handed over to the authorities and the elders will condemn me and the Gentiles will crucify me. And Peter jumps in and says, I will not let that happen. And Jesus swings on him and says, get behind me, Satan. Satan loves the glory of Jesus minus cross. And so did his brothers. And so did these folks in 223. They had seen signs. They had seen signs. And they love power and they love signs. This is our Messiah and he's going to do the signs for us and he's going to win the victory and he's going to establish the throne and we're going to be swept into victory to squash these Romans. And, and Jesus looks at all that and he says, I'm not going with that. I'm not walking with that. That's not the faith I came to produce. It's a faith. It's a faith. 
lot of people think my miracles are are fake. You don't think they're fake. You're believing in them. It's not the faith I'm after. So, I think the point of this text on the, on the sign part is that we today should be warned about sign chasing, signs and wonder chasing. I don't know when the second coming is going to happen, but it's going to happen. It could happen in my lifetime and yours. And there's some things that are going to happen. They're already happening. And I'll read you one. This is a warning from Jesus to you and me. Matthew 24, 24. False Christs and false prophets. So big time and little time, guys. False Christs and false prophets. Sun Moon considers himself to be Christ. False prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The elect cannot be led astray, but oh, it's close. So powerful are the signs and wonders that are done by the false Christs and the false prophets that thousands of people are swept out of the church into allegiance. And they turn out to be John 2.23 believers. They were hanging on the signs. They were hanging on the music. They were hanging on the whatever. But they hadn't penetrated through the signs to the Savior. They hadn't seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. They had stuck on the externals and they'd not broken through to the person himself and loved him. And on that score of love, let me read you one more. One more text. This one's from Paul. From 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, about what's going to happen before the second coming, and it's happening already. Paul said, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. Now, that's a precursor to the Lord Jesus, a lawless one. A strong leader can reject the law of God and be lawless in the world. The, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and lying signs and wonders. I translate it that way. The ESV has false signs and wonders. The translation false signs and wonders sounds like they're not real. It sounds like they do, he's doing it with microphones. Or mirrors, rabbit out of a hat. It's a trick. It's not really a sign of war. It's a trick. That's not what's going on here. These are real. This is satanic power and deception here. These are lying signs and wonders. I'll keep reading. Verse 10. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. They, they believed. And they're swinging this way with this sign worker, and this way with this sign worker, and this way with this sign worker. And the next person comes along and does some amazing wonder. They'll flock to him, and then they flock to him. Because they didn't love the truth. Meaning, when they read John 1.14, it didn't happen. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And from that fullness, we have received grace upon grace. Now, that is a glory that is attracted by the signs and wonders that he does, but it's all pointing towards his person. Saving faith rests on the glory of the person of Jesus Christ. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. 
not the light of the gospel of the miracles of Christ. Miracles are meant to reveal who you're dealing with so that you love him, know him, cherish him, so that he becomes the resting point. And when another prophet comes along, another Christ comes along, doing greater miracles, perhaps, than the ones you've ever seen or come to terms with, you are so locked in to Jesus as self-authenticating, glorious Son of God. You cannot be swept away. You will not be one of those 223 believers because you have penetrated through the signs and wonders to the person and you rest in him. That's what the goal of this text is. And let me close by simply saying, wouldn't you think that if you were Jesus and you knew what was in every heart in this room, totally, you knew what was in every heart in this room, and you spotted that one of those hearts sitting over here somewhere was starting to go berserk, had a knife in their pocket, and had resolved to stab you, me, the preacher, on the way out. If I knew that, which Jesus does, I'd go out that door. <laughs> Wouldn't I? So why didn't Jesus go out that door? Why did he walk up to the man? <laughs> and he's dead. He chose Judas. Here's the reason. What you would do with your omniscience and what he does with his are very different. He chose to use his omniscience to get himself killed. That's what he did. We think, oh, if I just knew enough, I could avoid stock market problems. I could avoid infection problems. I, I could avoid murderous situations. Why? I could have the best of all possible lives. But Jesus did the opposite. Knowing exactly what was in man, he walked into situation after situation where he got in trouble and finally got killed. And he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you walked in here unprepared to hear the truth that Jesus knows everything about you and hear it as good news... And you have been wondering, how could anybody regard that as good news if he knows everything about you? Here's the answer. He uses his omniscience not to kill you, but to save you. That's what you're offered now. If you will have it, if you will receive him, believe in his name, then he died for you. He took the knife for you, he took the nails for you, he took the sword for you and the crown for you. And you are now on the brink of eternity. Let's pray. Father, we worship you and we worship your son, the Lord Jesus, who knows us and knows all men and who knows everything about us and everything about everybody. And we stand amazed and in awe of this knowledge. It is glorious to us. Nothing compares with it. We tremble at the thought that he knows us, and then turning to him, the crucified one who died in our place so that we might know him without fear, and we lay down our fear, and we receive forgiveness, and we receive acceptance, and we receive love, even though you know everything everything about us. If any is afraid to do that, Lord, help them. Help them now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. 
Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our series, Behold the Glory of Jesus, with a sermon titled, Look and Live. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.